for those who have uh, logged onto the call, we're just going to wait a couple minutes uh, uh, while folks assemble. Uh, so we're we're here. Uh, you're at the antiretroviral for prevention um, C inter CFAR uh, working group um, call. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes. We will start in about a minute. Um, and just for those who are already on the call, um, we'll very much appreciate you submitting uh, questions you have in the chat. Um, and we'll be um, addressing those questions uh, uh, after uh, Dr. Lockman uh, finishes uh, her presentation. Uh, so thank you for being here. I think we'll get started. Um, my name is uh, Ken Mayer. Um, I'm um, a member of the Harvard uh, Center for AIDS Research and in conjunction with my uh, co-chair, uh, Patrick Sullivan, uh, the Emory uh, Center for AIDS Research. We're really delighted to uh, welcome you this afternoon to uh, our research in progress uh, uh, webinar series. We do this every other month. Those of you who are investigators and have interesting data, please uh, communicate with Patrick and me. We're we'll very happy to feature you one of our future sessions. Um, so our format today, uh, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Shaheen Lachman. Uh, Dr. Lachman is an associate professor of medicine uh, in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School um, and a key principal of the Botswana Harvard Partnership. Uh, she also has faculty appointment at Harvard T. C. Chan School of Public Health. And she's going to be talking about some of the landmark work that she and her colleagues have been doing in Botswana over the years looking at HIV treatment in pregnancy and, and also deal with some of the uh, broader issues of, of uh, integrating other people's work. Uh, Dr. Lockman will present and then at the end, after you put your question in the chat, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sullivan will be moderating um, a discussion uh, for the end of our session. So Dr. Lockman, really thank you so much for uh, agreeing to present today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I know that people are attending HPTN and, and numerous other meetings, but I'm always happy to speak about um, pregnancy and HIV um, and antiretrovirals, a, a very important topic. So um, Okay, so in the talk, I will use the term woman to refer to cisgender woman just for purposes of the talk um, and um, and brevity, but um, that's obviously not ideal, but I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, and I'm going to build upon a talk that I gave at CROI last year, um, because I really think that we need to consider outcomes other than vertical transmission prevention um, uh, in considering uh, use of uh, HIV treatment or prevention agents during pregnancy or lactation. And so I'm going to use this as a little bit of a soapbox, but I am going to include some more recent data. I will start quickly reviewing vertical transmission prevention and where we're at. I wanted to then touch upon ARVs and pregnancy outcomes, congenital anomalies, maternal health outcomes, and some key child health outcomes. Uh, quickly review current pregnancy ART recommendations and really hone in on some uh, uh, evidence gaps um, and, and the, the little bit of data that we're starting to see trickle in on long acting ARVs uh, in pregnancy and then kind of argue as to how we can uh, do, do better with uh, acquiring and incorporating uh, pregnancy and lactation data into our practice so that we can protect women through research and data rather than from it. So the scope of the issue, uh, as you know, half of uh, people with HIV globally are women and about one, more than 1 1.3 million women with HIV are pregnant each year. Uh, don't have a great handle on the numbers in the US, but probably in the five to 8,000 per year range in the US. And globally, most women with HIV will be pregnant at least once following diagnosis. Although of course we don't want to define women by their fertility. It's nevertheless important consideration. It's thus really imperative that we 
um, that we identify the safest and most effective uh, HIV treatment and prevention regimens for women and their children so for, throughout their life courses. And uh, what we find during pregnancy can ultimately affect HIV treatment of millions of individuals as we found uh, with the diatagavir neural tube defect story. Again, as quick review, I think you all know this, but um, in the absence of any intervention, about 20% of non-breastfed individ uh, uh, um, uh, and up to 45% of breastfed infants will acquire HIV. Um, this bar chart shows transmission rates by ARV intervention uh, through uh, with various historical studies over time and whether or not the child breastfed. And we did find, we know that an increasing, using an increasing number of ARVs for longer duration showed that we could really get transmission to as low as 1% even during breastfeeding with maternal three drug ART through pregnancy and breastfeeding. So transmission is very low in the setting sustained viral suppression on ART started early in pregnancy. This figure shows vertical transmission, the percent with vertical transmission in more than 8,000 non-breastfeeding mother infant pairs in the French perinatal cohort. Timing of ART start in pregnancy is shown on the x-axis, ranging from before conception on the left until third trimester start on the right, and also by viral load at delivery with less than 50 in blue. And regardless of timing of ART you start, you can see lower delivery viral load is associated with lower transmission, and there's lower transmission with earlier start in pregnancy. Although here with the red box, very low level transmission can still occur with first trimester start and undetectable delivery viral load. Um, the lowest transmission occurred with ART from prior to conception. And really earlier start is better in terms of preventing vertical transmission and maternal viral load is the strongest independent predictor of vertical transmission. Here are some more recent data from the same French perinatal cohort extended through 2017 now among women with HIV and their non breastfed infants. And these results on this slide focus on the more than 6,000 pregnant women who were taking ART at conception. You can see really first that the proportion of women who are virally suppressed at delivery increased from 70% at the beginning of the study period to 93% in the later years, 2011 to 2017. Sorry, those data are not shown on the, in the graph in the table. But what I really wanted to highlight is that zero vertical transmissions occurred in the 50, nearly 5,500 women who um, were on, taking ART at conception and who had undetectable viral load near the time of delivery with undetectable defined as less than 50 copies per mil for the vast majority of women. Um, and tr vertical transmission occurred in only one woman in, uh, who had a viral load between 500 to 300 out of 500 women. And so we really take away that undetectable really pretty much equals untransmissible from the data that we have, these being a great example. With when women are taking ART from conception or prior to conception and have um, sustained viral suppression and do not breastfeed. What about you, does U equal U during breastfeeding when for, in mothers who are taking treatment? Unfortunately, there is still surprisingly relatively little high quality data on vertical transmission in women who have documented viral suppression while breastfeeding. Here are examples of two such studies. Women with HIV in the Botswana Mabana trial started three drug treatment in pregnancy and continued treatment through six months of breastfeeding. Only two out of 677 breastfed babies acquired HIV, and their mothers had plasma and breast milk viral load less than 50 up to the point of HIV infant diagnosis. One woman had a low level detectable viral load at delivery. Some women in the promised trial breastfed while taking ART. About seven or about 0.6% of their babies, babies acquired HIV through bre during breastfeeding. In two of these seven babies, the mums had detectable viral load at delivery, but virologic suppression thereafter. Sorry. So obviously the recommendations are to formula feed where it's safe and feasible. Um, and really formula feed is recommended in the US with patient-centered counseling risk reduction support for women choosing to breastfeed. From what we know now, U does appear to be very close to you during breastfeeding for women who have sustained postnatal virologic suppression, but it's not quite as clear as um, antipartum, with antipartum ART. 
So does ART regimen affect vertical transmission? We know that integrase inhibitors reduce viral load more rapidly when started uh, than, than most other drugs. And that's also true for DTG compared with efeverance when started in pregnancy. And so you might expect that INSTEs would be uh, able to further reduce vertical transmission. In one meta-analysis of five trials comparing DTG versus efavirenz-based ART, women in the DTG arms had higher rates of virologic suppression at delivery, as you can see here. However, all five infant infections were actually in women uh, taking DTG. These observational data show very similar transmission rates, vertical transmission rates in pregnant women starting DTG-based ART in pregnancy, that's 0.8% in blue, versus efavirenz-based ART started in pregnancy, 0.9% in orange. So there's really no evidence yet that DTG-based ART started in pregnancy leads to lower transmissions, although these studies are not large enough to see very small differences. So we know how to really pretty much shut down transmission. How well are we doing globally? The number of new pediatric HIV infections shown by the gray line continues to decline uh, as, as the proportion of women taking treatment in pregnancy has increased, although we're kind of leveling out with about 85% of women, pregnant women globally on ART during pregnancy in 2020. You can see that in the green bars. More women are also conceiving on, on ART over time, but 150,000 new pediatric infections occurred in 2020 is obviously far more than we want. This figure shows the number of new child infections in 2020, and the different colors in this bar represent different underlying reasons for transmission now. These are global estimates from 2021 pub data, um, but uh, UNAIDS publication, but 2020 data. The four primary missed opportunities for preventing VT in order of most to least frequent were this first, that the mother uh, did not take ART in pregnancy or during breastfeeding, and this was often due to a missed HIV diagnosis of pre-existing HIV, maternal ART interruption during pregnancy or breastfeeding, incident maternal HIV in pregnancy or breastfeeding, and lack of viral suppression in a mother who was taking ART. This slide shows US information from, from the most, we, we don't have great recent data, but the most recent data that have, um, that, that, are, that are kind of out there in a systematic way, um, show the decreasing number of new pediatric diagnoses in the US between 2014 and 2018 on the top left. And then on the bottom right, the estimated rate of vertical transmission among US born women with HIV during the same time period by race. And you can see here, once again, uh, disparities um, by, by race and ethnicity um, within the rate of vertical transmission, which ranged from 3.3% in 2018 in women who are African-American versus the 04 to 0.5% transmission range in women who are white or Hispanic or Latina. So some key points for vertical transmission are that viral suppression on maternal ART from early in pregnancy can nearly eliminate vertical transmission through delivery and a rate as low as 1% is possible even with breastfeeding. And the lowest transmission occurs with preconception ART, but we still have work to do to eliminate vertical transmission. Priorities include increasing early pregnancy HIV diagnosis and ART coverage and HIV retesting during pregnancy and breastfeeding in order to diagnose and treat incident HIV. Reducing HIV incidence in young women, of course, would be I, the, best, the best way, and finding strategies to better support retention and care and ART adherence, and of course, continuing to try to disclose these pernicious um, access gaps in our country as well as globally. So I wanna turn now to HIV treatment in pregnancy and adverse birth outcomes or adverse pregnancy outcomes, specifically preterm birth, low birth weight or small for gestational age, uh, stillbirth and neonatal death. So vertical transmission and congenital anomalies usually get the most attention. They're very visible outcomes and really have been a, a focus of a lot of research. Uh, over the years, but the effect of HIV treatment in pregnancy on other important outcomes has been both less visible and less easy to pin on specific regimens, but has at least as big an impact on the health of mothers and children. And I really want to emphasize um, th this point in this talk and in general, 
and why it's important to consider these outcomes uh, clinically, um, and also how we might, like some of the potential pitfalls of making comparisons between populations for these adver adverse pregnancy outcomes. So why are preterm birth and low birth weights so important for us globally? I don't think in the US we necessarily put this front and center because we often, but not always have good obstetric and antenatal care. But globally, preterm birth is the single most important cause of neonatal and under five mortality. And a number of other poor outcomes occur in very preterm babies, health, growth, neurodevelopment. Low birth weight babies also have a significantly higher risk of dying, particularly in low income settings. So these outcomes really matter, particularly very preterm birth, they're very low birth weight. At the same time, and this is important if you're considering research in this area or interpreting research, it's just important to remember that rates of adverse pregnancy outcomes can vary substantially between populations and by factors such as maternal age, location even within a country or a city, time um, of like temp calendar time, year, um, season even, as well as of course, access to obstetric and antenatal care, even when the outcome is ascertained in a similar way. So for example, this table on the left shows that the rate of preterm birth varies from 6% in Ireland to 25% Myanmar. And you can see that the rates of low birth weight, IUGR and infant mortality also vary widely between countries. In addition on the right, this is just one example of a study, this one, an observational study from Botswana, pretty old now, but showing that women with HIV often have higher rates of adverse pregnancy outcomes than women without HIV for even outcomes, including stillbirth, but also preterm births as small for gestational age and neonatal death, but not congenital anomalies. And I wanted to highlight both of these things because we really do need to be thoughtful and careful if we're comparing, comparing pregnancy outcomes between groups and observational studies, and also to advocate for high quality randomized pregnancy trials with these endpoints for high, very high priority agents. Now to move on to the impact of HIV and ART um, in a little more granular fashion on pregnancy outcomes. So you can see here in the pre-ART era, women with HIV had substantially worse pregnancy outcomes than women without HIV, around twofold higher rates of preterm birth, low birth weight, and stillbirth in women with HIV. You can see to the right of the line here. Of course, treatment in pregnancy is essential for maternal health. There's no, no counter to that. That's critical to emphasize and also uh, for their own mom's own health, but healthier moms also have healthier babies. So ART is recommended, but does ART return pregnancy outcomes to normal? So I'm not showing data on this specifically, but we do have data showing the outcomes, pregnancy outcomes are better with ART than without ART presumably because of some return in mater to maternal health, but it's not, um, not completely uncomplicated. ARVs can have pregnancy outcomes through other mechanisms. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of those examples. The first of them is this PROMISE trial. Um, the only randomized study comparing three drug ART to Zidovidine started in pregnancy among women with higher CD4 counts, this prior to the universal ART era. And this chart shows the proportions of women experiencing any adverse birth outcome on the left, low birth weight or preterm birth. Women randomized to start lopinavir or tonavir based ART in yellow had significantly higher rates, risk of each of these outcomes than with a woman randomized to start AZT with single dose nevirapine in blue. So if at least some three drug ART is associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes, does the regimen matter? And it appears to, this is just another example. It's not, certainly not an exhaustive review, but the, here we see data from the large Tsipamo birth outcome surveillance study in Botswana. And the lighter bars uh, show the rate of any adverse pregnancy outcomes with the darker bars at the bottom showing the rate of severe adverse pregnancy outcome among HIV negative women in blue on the left, and in women with HIV conceived on different treatment regimens in the other bars. And we do see a lower rate of adverse pregnancy outcomes in HIV negative women than women with HIV on ART. But we also see differences by regimen. Women on taking a Favrins based ART had the lowest, and women taking nevirapine, lopinavir, or tonavir based ART, the highest rates of adverse pregnancy outcomes, even when adjusted for age and other factors. 
Even severe outcomes like stillbirth can differ by regimen. And this can go rec unrecognized for many years without good data, particularly for a pretty rare outcome like stillbirth. So in the same study, um, six, the, the st uh, what was particularly concerning was that the stillbirth rate in women taking the verapine based ART was 6%. And this is the highest, this is higher than stillbirth rates in pretty much any country. It's extremely high rate. And while when we look, ultimately looked, um, the stillbirth rate was substantially lower with efavirenz and lower than with other regimens. And this was shortly after a time when efavirenz, as you may remember, was being recommended against for women with child, um, of childbearing potential, pregnant women, because of animal data suggesting a possible concern for neural tube defects that ultimately didn't pan out. So, a lot of un unnecessary stillbirths were happening while women were kept on nevirapine uh, rather than going being allowed to switch to evaverins. And of course, nevirapine, we don't really care about that anymore. Um, but what about more contemporary regimens? So I'll come back to this IMPACT 2010 or VESTED trial a few times um, with different outcomes uh, during this presentation. This slide shows pregnancy outcomes in this three-arm randomized pregnancy trial, which evaluated the safety and efficacy of dolutegravir plus FTAF, that's the dark blue bars, versus dolutegravir plus FTDF, the light blue bars, versus efavirenz FTDF in orange. All started in pregnancy between 14 and 28 weeks gestation in women with HIV who were treatment naive with the outcome by regimen on the, the percent outcome on the y-axis. So we found that DTG plus FTAF had significantly lower rate of any adverse pregnancy outcome, the composite, compared with either of the other regimens. And this is driven mainly by lower rates of preterm delivery and to a lesser extent, lower rates of small for gestational age. What was somewhat unexpected, what, what was unexpected, I should say, I wouldn't say somewhat, it was unexpected, was that we also observed a significantly higher infant mortality by week 50 after birth with maternal efavirenz FTDF. It was nearly 7% of infants had died um, these are HIV negative infants all, compared with either of the DTG regimens, one to 2% infant death. And, and uh, uh, the vast majority, more than 90% of um, participants enrolled in African sites, there were 22 sites, but this also enrolled in Asia, um, South America, and the US. So what about conception on ART? <clears throat> More women are conceiving on ART, which is obviously great, but we don't want to understand the potential impact of this and whether some regimens are safer than others to conceive on. This meta-analysis found that women on ART preconception, mostly in a varapine based, were more likely to deliver very preterm and to have low birth weight babies compared with women starting ART in pregnancy, as can be seen by again by the risk ratios to the right of the vertical line on this plot. The PROMISE study looked at outcomes of second pregnancies occurring in women with high CD4 after previous randomization to stop versus continue ART postpartum. And the percentage of women with the outcome is on the y-axis with women conceiving on ART in green and women starting ART in pregnancy in yellow. The rate of either spontaneous abortion or stillbirth was higher in women conceiving on ART than women starting ART in pregnancy. And this was predominantly P protease inhibitor based, lopinavir, tonavir based uh, ART. The bottom line is that ART from conception might be associated with worse pregnancy outcomes than starting ART in pregnancy, but the data are not conclusive and the results may well depend on the antiretroviral regimen. So the jury, I think, is still out on this and we need more information. And most importantly, it's clear again that the advantages to mother and child of uninterrupted maternal ART outweigh the possible risks and sh that should not be undermined. Just wanted to show this is some interesting data. I don't know if it will be confirmed, but newer data um, about a potential mechanism that could be associated with uh, worse outcomes with pre, uh, preconception ART. So this is a study in women from, with HIV in South Africa um, for whom placental histopathology was available for 53 women who were taking ART prior to conception and 77 women who started ART during pregnancy at a median 15 weeks gestation. And the vast majority were taking efavirenz 3TC TDF. You can see here that as there is a significantly higher risk of placental maternal vascular mal malformation in women who were taking ART preconception, 40% 
versus 19% in women starting ART in pregnancy. Um, and placental mas maternal vascular malperfusion was associated with both preterm birth and low birth weight. So this is at least with a Favrin's-based ART one possible mechanism, but I think this also needs to be confirmed in other studies. So some key points to summarize pregnancy outcomes. They are worse in women with HIV, even on ART, at least the regimens we've looked at so far, but outcomes, pregnancy outcomes are better on ART, certainly than with untreated and with advanced HIV. Pregnancy outcomes differ significantly by ART regimen. And I think this is one of the main points I actually wanna make with this entire talk is bullet number two. Um, in most of the world, common adverse pregnancy outcomes are also major causes of child morbidity and mortality. And we really need to know and incorporate data for these outcomes in our decisions and guidelines and not focus only on vertical transmission and congenital anomalies. Mentioning that though, I'll just quickly talk about congenital anomalies. Um, because that obviously is a concern for, for, for patients and providers and uh, public health practitioners. So as you know, major organs develop during embryogenesis from weeks three through eight after fertilization, during which major structural defects can occur with exposures. The neural tube closes very early within four weeks of conception before most women know they're pregnant. And I think we know this, but it's also very, very important to emphasize. Um, so, because we can really only assess the impact of drug exposure, antiretroviral or otherwise, during the most critical early first trimester um, period with post-approval surveillance or studies of women who become pregnant in other trials. This is not a, is a randomized trial situation. <laughs> The U.S. Antiretroviral Pregnancy Registry is a voluntary registry. I shouldn't say the U.S., but the data are primarily from the U.S. This shows a summary of the prevalence of birth defects with first trimester exposure to ARVs from 1989 to the most recent update publicly available, which is July 2021. Just wanted to remind you that we need about 200 first trimester exposures in order to be able to detect a twofold increase in any anomaly and 2,000 first trimester exposures to see a threefold decrease in rare anomalies like neural tube defects. At this point, the APR has sufficient first trimester exposure data on 22 ARVs. And you can see the red box at the bottom showing that overall the rate of uh, birth defects is similar in women exposed to any ARV in the first trimester compared to the two um, background comparators. Um, only Melfinivir and DDI had uh, elevated anomaly prevalence, but there was no clear pattern of defects for either of those. Now for a very quick update on preconception DTG and neural tube defects or neural tubes. As you know, in early 2018, HIV treatment programs started rolling out dolutegavir based ART. After being asked to do an early analysis in May 2018, the Zapamo study team shared the unexpected finding of a nearly eight-fold higher rate of neural tube defects in women conceiving on DTG-based ART, which caused massive consternation and um, was unfortunately largely interpreted as um, withholding DTG from young women in many places. Um, women with HIV and activists released a powerful communique arguing that blanket exclusions that deny women equitable access to this optimal HIV treatment are not warranted or justified. And with time, as the with additional surveillance in Botswana and elsewhere, and this is from Botswana, the prevalence of neural tube defects declined. The WHO uh, guidelines recommend first line DTG for all adults, including pregnant women and women who may conceive. Although unfortunately, women still not as lower proportions of women globally are receiving DTG compared to men, and that is, I think, in the process of hopefully being rectified. So this table shows the most recent prevalence of neural tube defects from studies with more than 100 preconception, sorry, preconception DTG exposures. The largest of these studies remains the Botswana Zapamo study, and the most recent public data from mid 2021, neural tube defect prevalence is setting settling around 0.15% with DTG preconception, which was still borderline significant, it was significantly higher, but very borderline than the prevalence of neural tube defects in women born a woman receiving a Favrin's 0.06%, uh, a woman without HIV 0.07%, but not significantly increased compared with women receiving a non-DTG ARV regimen. 
and several other studies um, from other places with varying folate fortification have shown similar neural tube defect prevalence. And I just, it's worth mentioning that all pregnant people or people may conceive should be taking folic acid, at least 400 micrograms a day. So very quickly to summarize for, uh, for congenital anomalies, two teratogens are very rare. We need prospective high quality, primarily post-marketing surveillance data with known large denominators to really evaluate for rare events, particularly with preconception exposures. And we need to provide these relevant data to women to support their informed decisions and do so in a, in a rational way. So what about the health of the mother? We know that many physiological changes affect pregnancy pharmacokinetics, including absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of drugs. And drug levels are often, but not always, lower in late pregnancy than the non-pregnant state. And so I, so I know this is intuitive, but it's worth noting that lower drug levels have more implications for efficacy than for toxicity. Um, transfer across the placenta or into breast milk does vary by drug though. So the overall good news, news this shows by um, whether the level of a given, a given ARV tends to decline uh, by looking at the arrows or remain essentially stable or rarely increase in pregnancy as well as drugs without much P, uh, with no or minimal PK data, pregnancy PK data. And the red boxes indicate that COBE boosted regimens should be avoided in pregnancy due to lower levels. So overall, the good news is that despite lower levels in pregnancy for most ARVs, virologic efficacy is generally maintained, but we do still need to look at and understand pregnancy PK for new drugs because every now and then we do find inadequate drug exposure. So in terms of maternal health outcomes, other than P PK, which can affect efficacy, what about weight gain, which is obviously a very hot topic or weight change? Um, again, uh, thinking about, I'm an internist, not an ob obstetrician. So just to remind us, low pre-pregnancy weight and inappropriately low weight gain in pregnancy can lead to low birth weight, small for gestational age and preterm birth. And it's really important to remember this as we're accustomed to thinking of weight gain as almost universally bad, um, especially in higher resource settings, but low weight gain is actually quite bad in pregnancy. On the other hand, high pre-pregnancy weight and too much weight gain, excess weight gain can also lead to outcomes such as fetal macrosomia, um, cesarean delivery, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and gestational diabetes. We're very familiar with this. This shows weight gain in the advanced trial. Um, when we're in non-pregnant women randomized to start DTGF TAF compared to DTGF TDF or a Favrin's FTDF. And so you're very, I think, familiar with these data and other you know, plenty of other data kind of show a similar pattern. So what about um, weight gain in pregnancy with different ARVs? We do see that that weight gain differs by reg regimen started in pregnancy. This figure shows the average weekly weight gain in the second and third trimesters, again in the observational Tsipamo study, with the horizontal dashed line showing the actual recommended weight gain in these trimesters. Women starting DTGF to FTDF in blue did gain weight at a faster rate than women starting Favrin's FTDF in green. But the weight rate of weight gain in both groups of women antepartum um, was, with HIV was significantly lower than in women without HIV and also lower than the recommended weight gain in those trimesters. In the randomized vested trial, which I mentioned earlier on the right, the relative pattern of antepartum weight gain with the same two regimens used in Sapama was quite similar in the green and the blue bars. Women in the DTGF TAF arm had the highest weekly weight gain in pregnancy. But again, all women with HIV had lower than recommended weekly weight, pregnancy weight gain. And this was especially true with the Favrins. This shows the patterns of antepartum weight gain by randomized ART group in the VESTED trial, looked at a different way. Higher proportions of women randomized to start Favrin's FTDF in the green bars experienced low or insufficient weight gain compared with the DTG arms, while higher proportions towards the right of the graph of women randomized to start DTGF TAF in pregnancy in the red experienced high or excess weight gain. 
This again, now from the Bested study, we, we looked at these patterns of weight gain as they pertain to pregnancy outcomes overall now collapsed across arms. And you see a forest plot of the hazard ratio for each of these adverse pregnancy outcomes among women who had low or insufficient weight gain compared to women with normal weight gain. And so dots to the right of the vertical line indicate worse outcomes with low weight gain. As you can see, low weight gain was associated with the occurrence of any adverse pregnancy outcome, that's our composite, and with SGA. Um, there was no significant interaction between this association and the randomized study arm. And when we looked at it in a continuous fashion, we found that a significant association between greater average weekly pregnancy weight gain and a lower risk of adverse pregnancy outcome invested. So weight gain was protective against adverse pregnancy outcome. A similar analysis was conducted by the IMPACT 1081 team. Among 281 women with HIV randomized to start world Tegravir versus a Favrins based ART at 20 to 31 weeks gestation. They also found that the INSTI raltegravir was associated with significant higher rate antepartum rate of weight gain and BMI increase than a Favrin's ART. Women on Raltegravir ART were less likely to have low rate weight gain and more likely to have high rate weight gain than a Favrin's. So very similar to what we saw in Vested. And women with low rate weight gain were significantly more likely to have SGA or any adverse pregnancy than normal weight gain. So it's again, the same, the same thing we found in Vested. And they didn't see differences in outcomes with high versus normal weight gain. So that's weight gain. What about the other, some of the other related outcomes? So um, we evaluated, let me just see if I skipped one, yeah. We evaluated um, maternal a hemoglobin A1C and random glucose at study entry during uh, pregnancy and during pregnancy at 12 weeks on study antepartum and at delivery and glucose and neonates at the birth visit. This analysis includes 348 mothers and 65 infants. And we used a hemoglobin A1C threshold of 5% 5, 5 or greater for prediabetes. One woman in the DTG FTAF arm developed hemoglobin A1C of six point, greater than 6.5% after enrollment, suggesting possible diabetes, but we did not do uh, glucose tolerance tests in the study. The top left panel shows A1C levels in mothers over time during pregnancy by arm with the Favrin's arm in dark blue. And the top right panel shows the proportion of women who had at least one A1C of 5%, 0.7% or greater at either week 12 or delivery, excluding women with elevated A1C at entry. There were no significant differences in A1C over time, nor clinically meaningful differences in random glucose levels among women or infants by arm although women in the DTG FTDF arm had slightly higher mean time average AUC glucose. Um, and so overall, um, there are really uh, no significant differences uh, in the proportion with elevated A1C after enrollment, but I would say that the sample size was modest, modest and there was a possible trend towards higher proportions in the DTG FT, uh, TAF arm with elevated A1C. So key points on, on the weight gain. Pregnancy weight gain differs by treatment regimen. Lower than recommended and higher than recommended pre-pregnancy weight and pregnancy weight gain can adversely affect different pregnancy outcomes. Greater pregnancy weight, may, weight gain may actually be protective in some women. What is unknown is the implications over the longer term with subsequent pregnancies and in different populations. I don't have time to get into this, but just wanted to show some other maternal health considerations when using ART in pregnancy that we should really, uh, that this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some um, more prominent examples. Of course, HIV drug resistance with short course prevention, but that's less of an issue. Virologic failure because of lower plasma drug issues, but this can be largely avoided if we, if we understand what we're dealing with. But we're also learning that um, that adverse effects of some drugs may difference, differ in pregnancy or postpartum compared to non-pregnant women, such as hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gastrointestinal intolerance, hepatitis, and possibly um, mental health or so suicidal ideation depression. I just wanted to show maternal hip and spine bone mineral density Z-scores at 50 weeks postpartum by randomized treatment arm in the VESTA trial again, and 154 women who had DEXA scans. 
Um, nearly all of these women breastfed, and uh, we did not observe significant differences in bone mineral density by arm. Um, although BMD tended to be a little higher with DTG FTAF in the dark green towards the left and a little lower with the Favrin's F2DF, but did not differ significantly in this modest sample size of around 50 per arm. So now very quickly, again, don't have time to go into great detail, but some, some key points to think, consider about child outcomes. So the vast majority of women now born to uh, children born to with HIV remain HIV negative and about 15 million children more now actually probably 16 million or 17 million are HIV exposed but uninfected or HEU. Um, and these children have in the past had higher morbidity and mortality than HIV unexposed children in low and middle income countries. Um, with some of these potentially due to uh, social factors that can also negatively impact maternal health, but probably also biologic factors. However, the health outcomes of these HEU children are improved by breastfeeding in places where formula feeding is unsafe and by maternal ART in pregnancy. So even if not reduced to fully the same health outcomes as HIV unexposed kids, um, breastfeeding um, and maternal ART definitely help. There's a lot of ongoing research evaluating the possible impact of ART on, in pregnancy on child outcomes, including on growth and neurodevelopment, but not limited to those. So HEU children in low-income settings are definitely at risk for restricted growth, but the impact of in utero exposure to ART, including to TDF, um, is not fully clear with inconsistent study findings. Similarly, neurodevelopment in young children hasn't consistently um, differed by in utero ARV exposure with a few possible exceptions, including slightly lower language and social emotional scores in young children with in utero atazanavir and efavirenz exposure and a possible association between in utero favorins and microcephaly and child neurologic abnormalities. But research gaps remain and include outcomes in older children and with newer ARVs. I just wanted to quickly show child growth by randomized arm from the VESTED study, again, because it is one of the few randomized uh, trials of different maternal ART regimens. This shows infant length for age, weight for age, and weight for length Z scores by arm with a Favrins in purple. So infants born to mothers who started a Favrins FTDF in pregnancy in purple were significantly smaller throughout infancy, starting even at birth than infants whose mothers started DTG, the, either of the DTG regimens. Stunting rates were high in all three arms. You can see on the left pan panel here between 13 and 21%. And stunting was again higher with efavirenz than DTG to the mother. Uh, the, the difference, there was no substantial or significant difference between FTDF and uh, TAF in combination with uh, DTG FTC. Um, in the middle panel, the direction of the weight for age analyses in kids was concordant with that for the length for age. So mean weight for age Z scores in the efavirenz arm was lower than the TAF DTG arm at both and lower than both DTG arms at weeks 26 and 50 of infant age. No apparent differences again were seen between TDF and TAF DTG at all time points. Again, the efavirenz arm had the highest proportion of underweight infants, about 11%. Two to 3% of the infants were obese by 50 weeks with no evidence of an increased proportion of obese infants in the TAF arm. There were no apparent differences between arms if a weight for length C scores. And really the mechanism for improved infant growth with DTG is unknown, and, but could be related to differential maternal weight gain in pregnancy. This now also shows infant bone mineral content at 26 weeks of age by randomized treatment arm in 165 infants in the VESTA trial who had DEXA at 26 weeks, and nearly all of them again were breastfed. Spine bone mineral content was significantly lower. Um, this is on the right, the right-hand panel. That's the only thing that differed between arms significantly. It was significantly lower in mothers whose infants were randomized to Favrin's FTDF than to either of the T DTG arms, although the clinical standard uh, uh, significance of this approximately half standard deviation lower bone mineral content with the maternal Favrin's FTDF are not entirely clear. This is a PrEP study now, the Prima PrEP implementation cluster randomized trial of FTDF PrEP counseling strategies for women attending antenatal care in 20 facilities in Western Kenya. And they evaluated the relationship between prenatal PrEP exposure and infant growth outcomes. The bar chart shows the proportions of infants who are underweight 
stunted or wasted in PrEP, unexposed in blue, and PrEP exposed babies in red. And they did not observe any significant differences. So this was quite reassuring. I, I'm not going to go into detail here because we will run out of time, but there is an ongoing, um, I just wanna highlight this because it's so awesome, um, an ongoing trial uh, looking at the safety of uh, the Depivirian ring um, in pregnant women. And pregnant women are randomized two to one to monthly Depivirian ring or daily FTC TDF. And they're starting, they have a great design where they start the study at late in gestation, late in the third tri trimester, and then move and roll women in the second trimester if that looks good. And then if that looks good, they, they go a little earlier in the second trimester. So it's really, um, a really great study. And so far among um, a relatively small number of uh, pregnant women enrolled, 150 so far, the ad birth outcomes look similar to uh, those in a in similar communities. And the team is doing, I think, a, a, a really trying hard to get comparable data from, it's not randomized, um, obviously, to no intervention. But so very quickly, um, here are the ARVs that can be used for treating adults. Highlighted are in black are the ones that can be used are, uh, in pregnancy. And um, those that either don't have sufficient data or not recommended are, are shaded out. Um, and two drug regimens like DGG3TC are still not recommended due to lack of pregnancy data. These are the regimens recommended um, in pregnancy globally. Um, per And if you really put it together by US, uh, European and WHO guidelines, and all three global guidelines recommend uh, three drug ART using two NRTIs, uh, TDF, FTC, or in the US and European guidelines, alternatively, a back of your 3TC, plus an integrase inhibitor, generally dolutegravir. Options in lieu of an INSTI or ritonavir boosted darunavir or atazanavir in the US guidelines, and a favarins in the WHO guidelines. Um, as you know, women conceiving with viral suppression on ART are generally recommended to continue their ART regimen, even if there are insufficient data for it, with just a few exceptions where you should recommend switching off of them because of uh, data suggesting that that's wise. And finally, guidelines re recommend supporting women to make informed voluntary choices about their treatment. Okay, some key evidence gaps. Here are some of the newer agents in phase two, three, or four trials with lots of exciting classes and mechanisms. And collection of pregnancy data is parent planned for only a subset of these drugs in dark blue, and nearly all of them in small post-approval PK studies, with the exception of the Depivirian ring, which I highlighted. One encouraging development, though, is that women who become pregnant, um, even in the longer trials of long-acting agents, uh, such as lenacapavir, and if they restart, is latrovir prep, as well as treatment trials with uh, long-acting cabril, will be able, uh, these are industry studies now, that uh, will be allowed to stay, consent to stay on study drug and contribute pregnancy PK and safety data in contrast to the usual practice of uh, mandating that study drug automatically be stopped if pregnancy occurs. And the contraception requirements for many of these trials are less stringent than some of the others when the, as long as the preclinical data look reassuring. So long-acting ARVs are important new drugs for both prevention and treatment, and may be particularly useful during periods of adherence challenge, such as postpartum, but they are long-acting. So even if stopped in the first trimester, many of these drugs will be present throughout pregnancy. And we have almost no human pregnancy or lactation data for long-acting agents yet. This is a... Um, safety and PK st study, uh, sorry, some, some data, safety and PK data of long-acting cabotegavir prep um, from the HBTN084 uh, trial. And I think as many of you probably also know, the open label extension will just uh, increase and enhance the pregnancy data. Um, in, the, in the study uh, to the, before the OLA, if pregnancy was diagnosed on study, study drug had to be stopped and open label um, Truvada was offered. Um, at the time this was presented this year uh, by Sinead, 49 pregnancies had been confirmed, 29 of them in women who were on Cab LA and had to stop it. Um, there were slightly more pregnancy AEs in Cab um, compared to um, TDF FTC, but they were, these are small numbers, nine versus one, small numbers, and they were judged to be unrelated to product. Um, 
sorry, adverse events, I'm sorry, not pregnancy outcomes. There was no difference in the pregnancy outcomes. And comparing um, CAB-PK in pregnant women in HPTN084 who stopped looking at the drug decay after stopping the CAB was really very similar to non-pregnant women in HPTN077. And just to remember that the, the half-life was 62 days. So again, they had a cabotography or on board uh, at delivery, even though they stopped it. So these are small numbers and we need more, but we're starting to see those data trickle in. So what about cabril treatment, long acting cabril treatment? Um, so the, again, we don't have a lot in the way of human pregnancy data, but um, one VEV study in 26 women who became pregnant on cabril and had to stop again, had to stop a study drug after pregnancy was identified and had quarterly PK sampling. Um, pregnancy uh, cab and real concentrations were within the range of concentrations observed in non-pregnant women. So that's what we've got. And then similarly from the same 26 women conceiving after being on Cabril long acting and stopping study drug, um, there were, uh, they, they kind of looked at the um, pregnancy outcomes and there were 11 live births, 10 were term, um, and you, there were eight elective abortions. So again, I don't think we can draw much from this. We need more information. Um, and real pivoting, uh, at least from, it looked safe from an anomalies perspective from the APR. Very quickly, I know we're, we're, I'm reaching the end, um, I promise. So what about monoclonal antibodies in pregnancy and lactation? Obviously they're not you know, being used for prime time yet, but um, for the most part, and, but we have essentially no data for HIV related MABs in pregnancy and lactation. We do know that MABs have been used safely um, during pregnancy to treat other conditions like IBD, MS, RA, cancer, and now COVID although again, published data for these conditions are also very limited. Um, most, but not all MABs cross the placenta. It's very unlikely that they will cross well into breast milk due to their uh, size of the, these molecules. Um, for MABs with endogenous human targets like ibilizumab, you do need the preclinical reproductive toxicity studies. However, for MABs targeting the pathogen HIV, so like for example, broadly neutralizing anti-HIV antibodies, you just need the tissue cross-reactivity studies. You don't need the extensive preclinical DART studies. Um, and again, there are no real, no published data in pregnancy and lactation. Um, one thing it would, in, in contrast to ARVs where if we have adequate PK exposure, um, during pregnancy, we're not so worried about efficacy. Um, there might be some theoretical reasons to look more carefully at vertical transmission with monoclonal antibodies, because if you just use one or a couple, you may, you could potentially select subpopulations that are resistant to these BNABs um, that could be more readily um, transmitted. So, okay, I'm gonna wind it down here. I just wanted to note that we are doing relatively well, even though not well enough in HIV and getting pregnancy data, but we need to do better. More than 90% of FDA approved drugs had no safety uh, or efficacy data in pregnancy up to 2010. And the vast majority of women take at least one drug in pregnancy for which they have minimal safety and efficacy data. And in research, the focus is often on the potential harm to the fetus of medications taken in pregnancy, actually in clinical care as well. But we have to remember that not taking an approved treatment during pregnancy or even an important research one because of lack of data can also harm the mother and, fe and fetus. So we need to keep that in, in the balance. Um, and then pregnant women are generally excluded from research, but that doesn't remove the risk. It simply ultimately shifts a risk from a setting with informed consent and monitoring to routine clinical settings once the drug is available or women are offered suboptimal treatment because of lack of data. So I think the phases group has beautifully argued that we need to make some conceptual shifts to inclu facilitate inclusion of pregnant women in research. Thinking of pregnant women as a vulnerable, a complex population rather than a vulnerable one, protecting women through research, the opportunity to take part in research rather than from research, and offering fair inclusion um, with independent decision making by, by the pregnant woman rather than presumptive exclusion. And I think that the COVID pandemic has only heightened um, the call to action, and there is some movement. So to summarize, um, 
Optimizing the care of pregnant women is central to our global approach to HIV treatment. It's not like a side issue. We know how to prevent vertical transmission, but implementation gaps remain and antiretroviral regimen can affect multiple pregnancy, maternal and child health outcomes. And we really need to understand and study and incorporate all of these outcomes in our guidance and not think only about preventing VT or anomalies. Um, women deserve finally high quality evidence for medications that they will use throughout their life course, including during pregnancy and lactation. And I wanted to thank several people for looking at the earlier versions of the slides, um, uh, an earlier version of this talk, but also specifically Dr. Lynn Moffinson for sharing uh, several slides that I adapted for this talk with the more, uh, some of the more recent data. So, and also thank the many women who take part in this research. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was uh, comprehensive and um, and clear and and compelling. So thanks for a wonderful um, talk and covering a broad range of topics. We have um, time for a question or two. Um, I think uh, if if folks want to post questions in the um, chat, I can present them, or if you raise your hand, um, Alberto can probably unmute you. Um, and I'm, I might just ask a question to uh, give folks time to get their questions in, which is, um, I, I mean, you did such a great job of, of laying out where there's evidence and where there's some evidence and where there's probably compelling evidence, but I was really struck by your comment that just, um, overall, lower proportions of women than men globally are being started with dolutegravir, independent of these issues. And so I wonder where you put sort of the, um, the uh, opportunity to improve around just equity issues. Um, uh, clearly, all the, the biological questions are important, but it seems like there's an equity issue that may um, be affecting women even more broadly than those um, who are pregnant or of childbearing age. So wh where do you sort of um, see the, um, like this, this other issue of, of equity or, or do, you, do you, we know what the drivers are of the, for example, the difference in um, starting regimens by yeah. sex? No, that is a key question. And I think the driver for that really was this, uh, the reaction to this neural tube defect finding. And I, I work primarily in Botswana, um, and was at the Ministry of Health when this finding first broke. And our immediate conversation was to say, let us please not yet deny women the opportunity to, to start or continue this, um, you know, this, this drug if they, if, if they preferred, if they had side effects on a favorance, you know, for, for many reasons. Um, but, and I think in Botswana, they, they um, actually took a more measured approach to changing their guidelines. But I think unfortunately, um, many country guidelines um, interpreted the, the, the findings, which I think were poorly communicated by the medical and public health community and without any nuance or, or it's not appropriate emphasis on, on individual choice, um, they were interpreted to mean that young women should not get dolutegravir. And so this, this is clearly that a holdover, the fact that many more women are still on a favorance than men, um, regardless of age, but particularly young women, is di directly linked to this issue. And it is an equity issue. And women with HIV were, in fact, um, at the forefront of trying to turn that around and, and advocating for themselves and saying, yes, of course, we care about our, our children, our unborn children and born children, but we are not simply vessels for children, uh, for babies. And um, there are many other things that go into our well-being and our health, which will affect our, you know, our, our quality of life and our, our kids' outcomes. So I think we need to do a much better job on so many levels with uh, listening to community, engaging to community, offering women choice, um, carefully presenting and responding to new findings and getting good data um, to help inform some of these decisions because we simply don't have enough of the last. Yeah. Well, and that I think you made that point um, wonderfully in the in the presentation. So 
Um, we are, it was a, um, it was a uh, comprehensive presentation and we're right at time. Um, so I, I just, on behalf of everyone who attended, on behalf of Ken uh, and myself, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing this. I know it's recorded as well. Um, and so we'll make sure with your permission that um, if others who weren't able to attend today uh, want to see it, that we'll make that available. And um, just uh, thanks for uh, the talk and all the work um, that you do and all the knowledge that you hold and for sharing it. And with that, with that, we'll um, uh, turn people back to their afternoons. And uh, I think we'll see everybody again in, in a couple months. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shaheen. Mm -hmm.